Hey, yo. What's up, guys? Dylan Rush here, joined today by the number four ranked UFC flyweight in the world, busting a 14 6 professional record. Former LFA flyweight champion fighting out of Factory X in Denver, Colorado. Brandon, Raw Dog, Roy Val. How you doing, Brandon? Good and yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. Happy to have to have you on today. Uh, first things first, have you checked out my boy Yusef Zalal, the Moroccan devil? Is he doing all right after yesterday? Oh, yeah, he ain't doing that good, bro. <laughs> he's down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He's a uh, he's handling the loss well. He's gonna bounce back like always, and you know. I'm expecting I'm expecting big things from Moroccan this Moroccan this year. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, we're all talking shit to him today. I mean, agree <laughs> because like uh, I know it's a soft spot for him or whatever. But I was like, I'm gonna beat you like a like I'm from France or whatever <laughs> all day. That's That's funny, kind of, he That's fought. Whole, re he yeah. fought recently, right? Yeah, he went and whooped some the ass. Uh, really? like, Colorado was like number one forty five prospect and oh, came really? and destroyed one round. That's awesome. So I know you are the Raw Dogs, very well-liked, well-respected nickname in the UFC and MMA community circles. Have you always been the Raw Dog, or was there ever a time you had a different nickname growing up? No, actually, uh, I I've never wanted to fight with a nickname. Growing up, I think people just called me, like, B. Like, that was always my nickname. But, like, like fighting, when I started fighting, I was like, nicknames are dumb. Like, I don't want a nickname. And then Raw Dog came along, and I was like, oh, well, I guess I have a nickname now. So it was just one of those things that kind of worked out. But I don't really want it to work out that way. It just happened to work out, you know. Speaking of Morocco and Youssef, what's I don't know your background. What what's your like your parent? Where are your parents from? Uh, my parents, everybody like my parents, my grandparents, uh, everybody that like because my family is like doesn't really know too far their past, but it's like pretty much Denver, Colorado. But uh, if like I did like ancestry recently. And uh, I'm mainly like Spanish and uh, Native American are like my two top things. So, yeah, I've just been making up tribes, whatever tribe sounds the coolest. So <laughs> what Native American tribe I, uh, that I'm from, but I claim Comanche. <laughs> so whatever. That sounds like a cool one. I might be totally far off with this. The reason I asked you that is because I feel like I I get a little Chinese vibe from your arm sleeve. No, like those houses. No, I was like super into like, uh, like. Well, kung fu movies and shit when i was younger so but like uh that, that's kind of what my tattoos derive from is just like uh chinese japanese like to just kind of like just martial arts in general you know uh, the philosophies the just just uh, as much eastern philosophy as possible kind of stuff and uh, yeah i was like always into stuff like that when i was younger and uh i was uh super into buddha when i was a little kid and uh just kind of trying to find my way through like one religions and then also just uh just want to like I, I didn't know back then but like it makes all the sense in the world I just like the beginning of me being a martial artist like when I was younger I was nunchucking I made I made like my first pair of nunchucks when I was a little kid oh my god uh, two broomsticks and uh, a little chain and nails so I, I wedged it through when I was younger uh, my brother because I, I didn't know what I was I didn't know what I was doing and I have an older brother I mean him like uh fought constantly like that was our whole entire relationship was fighting and then once UFC came along and box, like we're boxing fans and stuff, like we'd watch all that stuff together. But when I was younger, I'm a nunchucks and I was practicing in the backyard. He's like, you don't even know how to use those. Like you would never hurt anybody with them. And I remember like I sat back and he's like, what? He's like, what? You think you would hurt me with it? And I sat back and I was like, should I do it? Should I do it? And he's just like, you're not going to do anything. And then finally I just boom, whacked him in the face dirty with it. And I, got, <laughs> I got one good swing in there though. I got one good swing, swole up his eye and, uh, and I got my ass beat. So <laughs> that was how, pretty how much older is he? Two years. Two years. So yeah, my brother's three years. Yeah, yeah. So it's like we're we're not like it's not like an old enough age gap where he can't beat me up. Like it, it's still like kind of a close fight, but I pretty much got my ass. It was like old enough where he beat me up every time we fought. Makes sense. So growing up, you said you liked uh, a bunch of that stuff. Did you like WWE? Because I noticed you had the NWO tank on on the MMA hour. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was a huge WWE fan. Uh, all that stuff. WCW. Who'd you like? That. Who was your favorite growing up? Uh, always Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio. Oh, yes. My... Let's go. Let's when go. I was younger, I had like the Sting costume, all that stuff. Like I was a huge Sting fan, but uh, I'm a high flyer. Like I, as a flyway, I feel like I'm a high flyer. So it's like Rey Mysterio, Matt Harvey. Like those are some of my favorite ones. Yeah, my two were Batista and Ray. I always love Batista and Ray. Those are my two favorite. I, I have NWO shorts that are my favorite shorts. I couldn't find them, but I just found my Ric Flair. Oh, oh yeah. Nathan but but NWO shorts just like that, like that same kind of brand? 
Yeah, it's the same yeah. brand. I know exactly which one you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's just like the big letters, right? Yeah, all the way across it. Yeah. So somebody yeah. Had like a like a raw dog emblem, and it was like uh, I think it said raw, and it was like in the NWO type like font. I was yeah. like, damn, yeah. thick, yeah. Yeah, bro. Hell yeah. Uh, so I read that you started training BJJ and Muay Thai at 15. Yeah, yeah. So uh, wait, wait, go just go back to wrestling real quick. So I'm back <laughs> to that like, like you'll see it sometimes. Some of our fighters will start doing this. But I started that shit because I was like, uh, uh, I would like to say I started it, but like I was a huge DMX fan. Or like, uh, yeah, DX. Uh, DX. Yeah, I used to do that shit, DX. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, the first time I ever did that is like, I went smoke some dude and I, I put the X in the air and then I went, boom, right after. <laughs> and then everybody would do it. They wouldn't do this afterwards, they'll suck it, but like they would do this. So yeah, I started that like little, like, I like to say I started this in general. But uh, I definitely made it popular because I was doing that shit. And I would do that afterwards after I won a bite because it was just like I was a DX fan. But, yeah, I started uh, I started training all around martial arts 15. Yeah. Like end of 15, start, start to be 16. I got to tell a quick DX story real quick. Most awkward moment of my childhood, I swear, I was like six years old. I was literally like six, seven years old. And I got like sent home from camp because I went like this to a girl. And then my parents, <laughs> like my, my parents were like, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I knew it meant like, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if I can say on the interview, I'll cut it out. It just means suck my dick. Like, that's what it actually means. So I did that. And I'd like say it to my mom and I was like seven years old. So it was fucking that was awesome. <laughs> that's funny because I didn't even know like it meant all like I just like, suck it, you know, but I didn't yes. know it meant, like, you're so young. You're just doing that shit all the time. Like, but yeah, I didn't know. What, I didn't know what they were sucking, but I, wanted, <laughs> I was telling people to do that shit all the time. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you what brought you to training at 15? What got you into MMA? My brother a little bit. Uh, my brother, I had like beef with some kid that was a wrestler. He was he was a really cold wrestler, and I, I remember uh, when I was younger, we would we'd drive past this place. Uh, we would drive past this place, and uh, my brother would always be like, "Yeah, that's a martial arts gym." We used to watch fighting and stuff all the time. We used to like beat the shit out of each other. But uh, we'd we'd go past this place that I started. It's called Gums, and uh, he's like, "Yeah, wouldn't that be like a really cool place to like start training and stuff? Like, wouldn't wouldn't that like be a cool job?" Like, I remember him telling me that every time. He's like, wouldn't it be cool just to beat people up and stuff? And I remember like, me and this kid, me and this kid were gonna fight one day, and he was a wrestler, and I was like, I need to like no more jujitsu because like I practiced jujitsu, but it was like, like I was barely learning stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was good, but I didn't know. So then I went into this martial arts gym, kind of stumbled upon it, and then it just kind of took over from there. Like. I was already so obsessed with MMA. Like I knew, and especially back then, it was so much easier to like know the whole entire UFC roster, but I knew the whole roster from beginning to end. Like once a fight started, I knew who they're fighting, when they're doing it. I would play matchmaker, all the stuff. So it was like, it was just an obsession, man. You know, you're obsessed with this stuff. It's just like, it's an obsession. Then I started kind of training. And then once I started training, everything kind of like unfolded naturally. Like I didn't necessarily go in there where I was like, I'm going to be a fighter one day. I want to be a professional fighter, but it was just like, I wanted to get good at it. And it was like, I wanted to practice it and it was like I was already doing so much shit as a young kid like I wanted to be like when I was younger I wanted to be a ninja like a kung fu type of guy and then I was like trying to be Bruce Lee for years and I was like working with nunchucks and trying to do all this other dumb shit and then I wanted to be a boxer and then I tried to work like boxing and stuff so kind of just unfolded naturally to just all of a sudden MMA started taking a big like uh started becoming popular and uh I wasn't really into the ground game for a long time I thought I thought, and I thought kicking was lame. Like those are two things that I was like, who kicks in a fight? That's like some girl shit, you know? And then also I was like, why are you guys wrestling? Like that was, you know, like against everything I've ever learned when I was younger. So it was just like, but once I started getting to MMA, I'm like, oh, this is why I like, actually I got choked out by a guillotine. My brother, my brother put me in a guillotine, put me to sleep. And I didn't like, I didn't tap or anything. I literally went to sleep. I woke up and I was like, what was that? And like, he showed like he showed me it and it was like that was so easy like it was so easy to just put people to sleep like that and i was like so mind blown by like damn a choke like that it was one like the moment he started choking like it's so powerful that it's like it scares you you know but it was like you have no defense to it you're going to sleep and i had zero defense to it and went to sleep and in, in result of that <laughs> Did you ever like okay I, I better start like uh at, at the time i would only watch like chuck liddell and like fighters that stood up and stuff so uh then I, then I stopped fast forwarding through like the ground game portion. So I started learning stuff like slowly. So it's like, I was just learning by watching the UFC and WET and shit like that and pride and all that. Were you ever practicing WWE moves, throwing six one nines and swantons off the couch and shit or no? I still do that shit. I'll still arcade. 
<laughs> if I catch someone off balance or like they're turning their back, if I could RKO them in the, in a uh, in practice, I always go for shit like that. Uh, I love doing. I love doing. I see a clip of you doing that actually at at Factory X or something like that. Like yeah, RKO, yeah. I think. Yeah, we do all that shit yeah. at Factory X. It's just it's just a bunch of bros shooting the shit pretty much the whole time there. You guys seem cool. It seems like a cool gym. Definitely, I'm definitely gonna make my way out there one day when I'm not broke. But uh, did you like any fighters growing up, like uh, MMA fighters? Was, there, was it Chuck? Was it someone else that kind of got you into the sport more so? Chuck was one that like got me into the sport for sure. Uh, Miguel Torres, I, like, was one of my favorite fighters when I was coming up, and I still think he was probably one of the best fighters at the time. Like, he was such ahead of his time. Uh, who got me into the ground game was uh, Shinny Aoki. Like, I hate it. I hated jujitsu. I hate it. Like, I thought the ground game was so lame. And then this dude was like wearing these little long pants or like spats and stuff. And then you see him choking people in like weird ways and doing all this crazy stuff. So it's like, I feel like a lot of the stuff I do now is even based off of like his game and stuff like that. So it was like, I had a bunch of different idols. Nick Diaz was like my favorite fighter for years, but uh, I don't know if he's one of the ones that got me into the sport. Like I, I, I was into it probably a little bit before he was like uh, super popular and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, Evans I, I, got me into the sport. What was that? Rashad Evans got me into the sport. Nobody else says that, but I always loved him. And he, I started watching, I became a fan of him before I even became a fan of UFC. Like I just liked him for some reason. I was young and yeah. yeah. He was cool, man. And then he was like a wrestler when he first came on the, came on the scene and then he was just knocking people out and he just like made big adaptations and stuff too. It's cool to see his transition now too, like who he's became and all that too. Definitely. What about you though? It's funny hearing you say that you hated the ground game, the subs. What do you have? Nine submissions and 14 wins now? Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have, more submissions than anything for sure so it, it's kind of funny how it just turned around for me and like became the opposite mm -hmm. but it was like uh when i was younger too it was like all my favorite fighters were not wrestlers like none of them wrestled like bj Penn, nick diaz uh even shinioki it was like if they if they like got the if they got taken down they like they're like all right cool fuck it so it's like that kind of became my style too it was like all right i'm gonna strike with someone until they take me down and once they take me down then that's our rule you know and then it's just like i was always kind of like a pick your poison type of thing. And that's actually like a, something I heard of specifically in a, a Miguel Torres fight is Miguel Torres fighting. And they're like, he wants to take the fight wherever the fighter wants it. And it's like, that's always what I wanted my style to be. It's like, if they want to strike, that's where I'm going. And if they want to wrestle, then that's what we're doing. If they want to play the ground game, then that's what we're doing. It's like, I just want someone to feel in danger wherever they're the most comfortable at, at all times. Uh, Joe Rogan, he said, Everyone loves you because you're a killer be killed style. You got nine first round finishes. You have three fight of the nights and six UFC fights. Do you pride yourself on being like an exciting fighter and put, giving the fans what they want to see? Yeah, yeah, a, a little bit, man. I don't necessarily think of like an exciting fighter, but I, I think I thrive in chaos. And like, that's what I, I like. I like a lot, man, is like, I like creating chaos and then just being in the mix of it. And I feel like that's where like, one, I'm the best, like I'm the best in the world there. That's how I feels like when chaos is going around i know how to channel it the best but it's just like also it's like I, I know how to survive there i know how to be there and it's like i'm comfortable there you know like that's that's home to me so even it's like kid, I, I love right? creating i read that you said yeah. that even as a kid right yeah 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 and that's exactly it. just like uh, i'm okay with being punched i'm okay with all that stuff because it's like it's nothing new to me i've been in the middle of all that shit i got my ass with my whole entire life so it's like not like none of that is anything like uh is anything strange to me there, there's a couple of cool moments in the ufc uh, that, that i like i was able to like go back and like see like in the kai car france fight or the brandon moreno fight and uh a, a lot of them is like where i'm in the middle of exchanging they're hitting me and i'm hitting them and like i go back and i smile and it was like it, it was kind of cool because i remember those moments too where it was just like i'm having fun you know it's like mm -hmm. I, I have fun in there and uh yeah that's that's the life it's the life i chose sometimes i hate it sometimes i hate like thinking about like how chaotic i am and stuff but it's just like like in the middle of it, I don't give a fuck. Like in the middle of it, I do not care at all. It's like that's home to me and that's where I love to be. You wrote that you find peace when you're fighting. You find peace in the violence or something like that. That's that's a cool quote. Yeah, I feel like also I'm like a classic overthinker too. So it's like I overthink a lot of scenarios and like when I'm fighting and then like them when when the lights are on and all that stuff is like I don't think at all. I just go, you know? And that was like my only time I can shut off my mind and like everything leading up to that point everything leading up to that point is like uh like i'm fucking oh shit like i'm about to fight uh, this 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 and the moment that i'm in the middle of an exchange is like okay i'm not thinking this is just life and this is what we do you know and uh and i'm, I'm able to find peace there and i'm able to kind of be myself there and just 
not fucking overthink things. And that's also why I think I have a lot of like first round finishes too, is because like, I don't like the, the like non-action part of fights. Like that's when I start doing like overthinking stuff. It's like when I'm not throwing punches or if someone's not punches at me or like all that is like, when I'm like, all right, what should I do? Should I think? Should I move? Should I do this? Should I touch his hand? Should I do, you know, I'm thinking of a million different things. That's like, I don't like that shit at all. It's like, that's why I just like to go. It's like, fuck it. Like I'll, I'll go first and then figure it out on the way. But it's like, I don't like to just sit back in the neutral position and wonder if they're going to throw a punch and then wonder if they think I'm throwing a punch or any of that stuff. It's just like, I don't think about any of that shit. I just want to just fucking make chaos for them. And like, <clears throat> I always think too, is like, especially when I was younger, I, I would start my, I'd run across the cage and pretty much like start a fight with the head kick. Like I literally run across the cage throw a head kick and it was just like I want people to be afraid you know what I'm saying like I want to like install fear in these guys and like I want to program these people to be afraid of me this whole entire time so it's like I want them to know that I'm not fucking around the moment that bell rings I'm coming across trying to take heads off and uh go home go home as quick as possible you know that's what makes you exciting though whether or not your intentions to excite the fans it's like nobody's ever accused Brandon Roy Val of point fighting or fighting not to lose or trying to stall in the fight like that's not something that you've done so uh, definitely respect yeah. so you're currently riding a two fight win streak you defeated Bontarine and Matt Schnell at UFC 274 after suffering two defeats in a row before that was there anything specific you changed in between that two fight losing streak and this current two fight win streak yeah I mean with the Moreno one I got shoulder surgery which was like super I needed that bad but with the Pantoja thing is like sometimes I, I like uh, sometimes my like and it's like a classic Greek Greek mythology thing is just sometimes what makes you the best person also gets you in trouble. And it's like uh, that that was one of those situations where it was like I was being too chaotic. There's a time to kind of like reel it back in, too, you know, and it was like that. That was like uh, when, when I, the second round with Pantoja, I remember I looked across from him like, oh, I have this dude broken. And I was like, all right, let's go finish this fight. And uh, I kind of just rushed to finish instead of just kind of like, OK, like I have him exactly where I want him. Let's be smart right here. Um, think a few things through and then we can kind of go for it. You know, so it's like sometimes I do get chaotic. Sometimes I do get a little crazy. And sometimes it's like it, it, the best case scenario and the best thing I could do for myself is just pull myself back a little bit. And it's not even a lot, like just a tiny bit more. And I win that fight every time. And it's like that, that was the situation at hand is like I, I lost control. I thought I had a finish. So I was like, all right, every punch I'm going to fucking throw as hard as I can. And I like overcommitted to a punch and just gave up my back like an idiot. And like, I think all Pantoja's finishes pretty much are from his back or from like a rear naked. So it was like, I put myself in a horrible position. I put him in the best position that he's already the best at. So it was like, I messed up real bad on that one. So just calm myself down and just realize when I have someone already beat and it's like, that's the time to kind of, not be my chaotic self. Sometimes it's just, all right, all right, like pull back a little bit, be smart, be a little methodical, and then we can kind of go back to being myself. It's just like create some chaos. And if, if everything's chaos, if everything's chaos the whole entire fight, then then nothing's chaos, you know? So it's like sometimes like like you need peace and chaos, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, so with like a little bit of neutralness, a little bit of calmness, it's like then chaos can really happen. And it's mm -hmm. like, and that's like the, just the truth is just, uh, but like create, cause some calmness. And then once there's a little bit of calmness, then chaos can happen. And, and chaos doesn't happen if I'm being chaotic the whole entire time. Cause that's just a fucking, that's just what we do. You know? I need to create a little bit of peace and then create some chaos. And then that's where I'm going to be the best in the world at. So I uh, got to cover UFC 274, my lone UFC event. I was fortunate enough to speak to you after you defeated Snow. I got to ask you, was that the first time? I feel like they might've asked you in the post fight, but Schnell tap with both hands. I've never seen that before. Is that something that you've, uh, some, have you ever made someone tap with, you know, he went like this, like he tapped with yeah, both yeah. hands. Is that a normal thing? I mean, I've never seen it before. Like in a fight or like, I've never had someone do that, but the, the choke I had on them was clean. Like uh, I caught him in a guillotine and normally like, people hit high, high elbow guillotines like this, but I grabbed the back of my elbow. So I raked it up even higher. So it went from like, let's say this is a space that you could choke. You can't see it because I'm wearing like a lot of that, but like, mm -hmm where I could pull it up right here, where it's like, if I get behind there, then that choke gets like extra tight. So I remember when I grabbed it and I pulled it, I was like, dang, the sheet started getting tight. Uh, he, he tapped one time already. So he did like this. And then when I got, when I got the extra crank on it, he did a double tap. So it was like the first time he tapped like that, I didn't see it necessarily, or like I, I didn't notice it. But then when he did the double tap, I didn't even notice he did double tap. I just saw the one tap still until I watched the video later on. So 
Was yeah, it, but that was a, like a really nice guy, though. It seemed like you guys were cool. Was it good to see him two months later? He got that amazing comeback over Sue Majeria at uh, UFC Long Island. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that, that's like also something like, like he, yeah. Matt, Matt Snell, before I got to the UFC, was like tweeting. Uh, uh, I had an LFA fight. One of my last LFA fights. Like they, they need to sign this kid. They need to sign Roy Ball. They need like he was huge on promoting me. And like if you ever seen me fight, and you ever seen Matt Snell fight, me and him have very similar styles. So it's like. He's always been one of my favorite flyweights to watch. And like he still just uh goes out there and does amazing things. And it was like with that Mateus Nikolai fight, I feel like him and Simo Jari was in such a war. And then he also on the same card, it was Taitu Ivasa, right? He was in a war with uh Cyril Gone. And it's like then yeah. he'll return to a fight two months later. And it's like, I don't know, man. That like I don't think it's smart to just rush one fight to the next fight, especially after a war like that, where it was like I think Matt Snell's good, and I, I think Mateus Nikolai is good. But it was like, I also don't think you could see really what Matt Snell could do because he's in a situation where he probably was concussed several times in that fight, you know? And uh, that Simu Jari fight, he was in a lot of danger. So it was like, uh, I don't know. I, I felt like he rushed a comeback. And same thing as Tai Tui Boss, that's a guy that could take a punch. And he pretty much walked out there and got clipped one time. And, and like, and like maybe that's what he could only take. All week. All week leading up to the fight, I was like, this is like a really quick turnaround for Tui Boss, who just got knocked out by Gone. Like, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about Snell, but yeah, I'll, me and my friends were saying that all week. Like, we didn't think Tui Vasa, we kind of saw what was going to happen. I mean, we didn't know it was going to end in a minute, but like, kind of seemed like he was rushing the comeback, like you said. Yeah, yeah. And same thing with like, like, Matt Snell was a big danger in that uh, Sumo Jari fight. Yeah. Sumo Jari's a dangerous fucking opponent. Like, that kid's good. Um, and he was in danger. So, I don't know. Uh, uh, it sucked to see him go out and like if Matt Snell's fighting, I'm gonna be watching. Like I'm a huge fan of that kid. Uh, I probably will root for him the, his whole entire UFC career against unless he's fighting one of my teammates. Then it's like, other than that, I'm I'm going for Matt Snell because he he's really cool to me. He was a really cool human being. Every time I met him, he brought me watch. It's actually right here. I had to, I had to put it down. Yeah, but he bought Nikolai me. a gift too. Yeah, yeah, yeah he gave me my awesome, card. Yeah. I've never I've never had a UFC. Career. So it was like, or at least of myself, I, or in general, actually. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he got me right here. So it was, it was pretty cool, man. Uh, he was, he's such a good guy, and like, I don't know, it was, it was hard to even like on fight week or like the day of the fight, I had to avoid him because I was like, I need to be mad at this guy, you know? Like I need to create some conflict in my head to be mean and like not want to see him. And it's like the day I saw him of the fight, he goes, "Hey, man, like, are you looking for a breakfast place? Like, there's a real good brunch place over here." And I was like. Thanks. Thank you, bro. But like, uh, I, I, like I, I was like, I can't look you in the eye right now. I can't do any of that stuff. But like, I can't be your friend right now. Cause like, I, I need to like have that conflict in my head, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. The, I've only been to two UFC events in my life, actually. It was 274 and it was UFC Long Island just as a fan. And uh, two of the best fights I've ever seen live, Schnell and you and Schnell and Suma Jerry. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely a fan of Schnell as well. Yeah, for sure, man. He puts out exciting fights. Of course. I got to ask you, unfortunately, I hate to say it. You've had a rough go of things as of late. Askar Askarov pulls out, then you broke your wrist. I see you're back to training. That's great. And then uh, you're out of the Abazi fight. So you seem like a very happy and positive guy, but has this unlucky stretch had any impact? Has it taken a toll on your mental health at all? Or are you just chilling? A little bit, uh, especially with pulling out of a fight. I mean, the and then also, yeah, yeah, man, it's the, the last like two months sucked a lot. And uh, the pulling out of the fight was especially hard on me because it was like, I've never done that. And it's like, I've, I've competed fucked up, you know, like when I fought uh, Moreno, Kai Carper, all of them, like my shoulder was hanging on by a thread. It was popping out every few, few minutes, you know, and it was just like one of those, like I would wake up out of my sleep with my shoulder dislocated. And it was like, I knew how to pop it back in. And it was like, it was almost that TJ Dillashaw thing where I was like, I was riding such a good wave and there was such a good opportunity in front of me that it was like, I had to take the fights, you know, but it was like with Amir Albazi, um, with Amir Albazi, my wrist was hurting really bad. And like, uh, I wasn't checking out and paying too much attention to it, but it was like, it was hurting really bad. And uh, I went to the Aleph Bay fights down in like Idaho to go corner one of my teammates. And uh, I was like, does this look weird? Like, uh, and I was telling like, what, like a couple people in the corner and they're like, yeah, that shit looks broken. And I was like, it does not look broken, but it's like super swollen, you know, it's super swollen. And I'm tatted right there. I have a bunch of tattoos. But then I looked in between the tattoos. And I was like, it was purple, purple. So then I went up to the doctor there and I was like, does this look like anything? And she goes, you either have a really bad staph infection on that, which like I had no like holes or anything like that could kind of be a staph infection. And she goes, or oh, that, that wrist is broken. She goes, I would immediately get it x-rayed. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, 
no big deal, you know? So then I go get it x-rayed and the doctor's like, yeah, that's broken. He goes, when do you fight? And uh, uh, it's supposed to be this week. So uh, I was like, uh, like tell him the date. And he goes, oh, that's perfect time. He goes, yeah, you'll, you'll be free right that week. He goes, you'll be free that day. And I was like, I have to train for this fight. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I have to train for this fight. So it was like one of those situations where I tried to train with it, like uh, cast it up and stuff. And uh, it wasn't like, it was not working out at all. Like I, I was run, like, I could run, I could jog, throw kicks, but it was like, in this fight, like there's, there wasn't really much for me to gain, you know, like uh, I'm fighting some dude kind of like, not, not ranked way far back than me, but it was like he's decent like nine, enough. Nine, yeah. He's like ranked number nine or 10 and uh, I'm ranked number four. And it was like, I took this fight on short notice to, because I was like, I wanted to fight before the years that you're ended, you know, it's like, I was supposed to fight Askarov, which is like a huge opportunity for me. And it was like, all right, that didn't work out. But okay, Amir Al-Bazi needs an opponent. So I was like, I'll, I'll take this this month. And like, we got a month and a half of training. And it was like, once I, I, I slit my eye open really bad. And then once my eye was back, the first week of practice, I then went broke my wrist. And then it was like, dang, I literally would not have trained at all for this fight. And it was like, there's not a, it's not a great opportunity for me necessarily. And it was like, there's a lot more risk than reward coming out of it. So it was just like, I tried to train and I, yeah, yeah, I took a week to try to go through it. And it was like, it, it wasn't working at all. And then it was just like, my coach and I were talking, he goes, we're going to pull you from this fight. He goes, it's not worth it. You're not going to be able to train. And he goes, uh, you're not going to have a peace of mind walking into that cage. And I think that's the most important thing for me is like knowing that I did everything to prepare for Amir al who's a good opponent, by the way. Like, it's not like he's a slouch, a lot of slouch or anything. It's like he, he could possibly like might more well next year If he wins this fight this weekend, right? You think you, you might run into him next year? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. And I assume he's going to win it. I, I don't know much about his opponent, but I assume he's probably going to take the W. But it was just like, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have been preparing for him the way that I would want someone to prepare for me. You know what I'm saying? So it was just like, I, I couldn't have done all that. So uh, yeah, it sucked, man. It was, it's horrible. And then with Asker, Asker, it's the biggest moment, one of the biggest moments of my life. You know, it's like, I've never trained so hard for a fucking fight in my whole entire life. I, I did three wrestling, three wrestling practice a week. I was working with the jujitsu coach, like a, a number five ranked jujitsu coach, Michael Liera at Logos. And, uh, I was doing everything I could to try to get ready for this fucking fight to make sure I, I win this fucking fight or I, at least at the very moment, like I put this dude away or whatever it is, you know? And then all of a sudden this next camp I'm going into is like, I'm doing the exact opposite. It's like, I couldn't do privates. I couldn't even grab, you know, like you can't grab anything. Your wrist is broken. It was, just, it was just so shitty. I couldn't lift weights. I couldn't do anything, man. It sucks so fucking bad. Yeah, so yeah, wrist is like the like that's definitely a spot like wrist control. Like you kind of would be screwed with a broken wrist in a fight more so than like I feel like a shoulder. I mean, both are bad, but I feel like a broken wrist versus a shoulder, the wrist would be harder to fight with now. Yeah, well, and then it was also like it was harder to train with too because it was like well, like one hand in it uh, when my shoulder was out and I was one handed, I was able to block and stuff. I tried to one hand it uh, the whole week, uh, like oh, one whole week. Uh, of just one handed, but still, motherfuckers are throwing punches, and it's like I can't let him. It's either I let him hit me in the face, or I parry it, or I block it. And next thing, you know, I'm fucking taking damage straight to the wrist and all that stuff. And it's like nobody could take me down, and I couldn't really like, and I can't just be like taking them down with them uh, them doing it. And then on top of that, I'm scratching people up with my shit, and it was just it was just a disaster, man. And it was like I remember originally, I'm like, all right, we're gonna get through this camp. I'm gonna get this shit off, and then will be perfect right enough from the time. But then it was just like, uh, it just created so much conflict within the camp that I was like, damn, I'm fucking all my teammates over. And then it's like, I can't get hit at all. And it's just like, it sucked. Makes sense. Uh, I read that, as I read this on Wikipedia, that after you beat Kai Kara France, you quit your full-time job in a juvenile juvenile justice system. What did you do for them for this? Uh, virtually security. They, they had like a, like a fancy name of like a, uh, I forget what they called it, but it was virtually security. I would just hang out with a bunch of juvies all day. It was, it was tight. It was like one of the coolest jobs I've ever that had. Sounds cool, bro. That actually sounds fun. Yeah, I mean, it was dangerous. Sometimes it would like you take a lot home with you, and then like I had a lot of frustrating moments for sure. Of like, uh, and even now, man, I still have a lot of frustrating moments that happen with these kids, and like just seeing them make some of the wrong choices and stuff. Uh, after the Ascrop fight, uh, or after the Ascrop fight got pulled out, I, I kept in contact with a couple kids. I keep, I keep in contact with a, with a handful of kids, but I was keeping in contact with this kid. And he's like, told me, he's like, Hey, I put a thousand dollars on you for the Sasquatch fight, which I was like, I never liked to hear that by the way, but it was like, I was like, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever it is. And then, uh, um, kind of just keeping contact, like everything going good. He's like, yeah, I'm looking for like a legit job and stuff. And like, 
I, I don't know how this is going to make portray me once I say this out loud too, by the way. But he's like, I'm looking for a job and stuff. And then next thing I was like, I haven't heard from him for two weeks. And it's like, it's very unlike it. Like, like, unlike it because me and him check in with each other all the time. It's like, I try to check in with these kids, you know, because it's like, I don't know, man. I, I feel like that's something that like a job that I loved a lot. Yeah. And like, obviously the UFC is my dream. So it's like, I'm going to take this career like to the fullest. But it's like that something I didn't want to give up on because I have a lot invested in these kids. Mm-hmm. But after, I, I didn't hear from this kid for like three weeks after that. So I'm like messaging him like, are you all right, bro? Like, what's going on? I Googled his name and he was arrested for uh, for a murder. And he was like, damn, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, I was probably one of like the last messages going back and forth. And it was like, man. And it's like, God, and I don't mean to sympathize for the, for this kid because he obviously created like a, like a, a horrible act. But it was just like, that's a kid that like had no chance in life. Like he... Um, yeah, he he came out of the juvie system. His mom died. His fucking didn't have a dad, and it's just like he pretty much got out of the juvie system and was just staying with who he could stay with. And he was doing some dumb shit, joined a gang, and he was already in a gang, but he like was back into the gang culture and all that stuff. So it was like, I don't know, man. He he came out and just did some. I mean, he, he was doing well originally, and then you know you, you could he they could see in our messages like he's like I, I want a legit job. Like, I'm trying to get a legit job. I want to I want to do everything right, you know. And it's like, I don't know, man. And like it was like a week after the Askarov fight when he did it, or like uh, like when when I was away from the Askarov fight when he got arrested and stuff. But then I'm messaging him like, we're like, hey, what's going on? Like, where have you been? You know, like and fucking just did some stupid shit, man. And it was like, again. I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. And it was, it's been like that. It's, it's been like that. It's like I lost a lot of kids on the opposite side of that too. It's like the the next week after that, or like two weeks after that, one of the kids I worked with uh, was shot and killed. And it, it's just like, it, it, yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't in, in a juvie for truancy. Like I wasn't in a juvie for truancy or any of that stuff. Those kids were, were in the middle of some crazy shit and a crazy lifestyle. And uh, yeah, you take a lot home with you. And uh, I don't know, you hope that you can make it any slight difference that, that like any of these conversations carry weight to them but it's like the reality is they're gonna do what they're gonna do and uh and if they're if they're around that crowd then they're gonna be doing some of the similar shit and it's like it's horrible to see it's admirable work though my uncle he's been a security guard for jury for like 30 years now and he's awful stories so many stories and like you said you take it home with you it's unfortunate but it's admirable work uh to switch topics real quick what can you tell me about Mark Montoya? I know so much about him. We got to go quick though, because I got a speed route coming up. But just tell me yeah. something people don't know about him. What is something that we don't know about Mark Montoya that the people need to know? Um, that he needs to know? I don't know. I feel like he's the hardest motherfucker I've ever met in my whole entire life. But I feel like everybody already knows that. Like, um, So I, I don't know anything that like you need to know. Like, uh, he, listens to, he listens to the country. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> A little bit, but he could kind of break dance. That's kind of cool. Really? <laughs> could, okay. A bit, yeah. But other than that, the hardest motherfucker I've ever met in my whole entire life. <laughs> I respect it. Moreno figgy prediction? Four? <laughs> Fourth prediction? Like, yeah, yeah. I switch I, I switch sides every time, but I, I'm going for Moreno. Okay. You did say, I commented on that live, you did say in the UFC 274 press conference that everyone in the flyweight division is so nice except Figueredo, he's, he looks like a douche or he's dislikable or something like that. Uh, all right, yeah. speed, speed round real quick. Who's the MMA GOAT? Nick Diaz. Okay, good. Favorite submission to practice? Uh, Gogo Plata. Oh, shit. Which actor would play you in a movie? Oh, what's that? Mario Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Uh, do you have a dream venue? I see you at the Apex lot. Would you like to be at maybe an MSG, a Saitama or something like that one day? Oh, yeah, yeah. MS- MSG would be like fucking, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. But my dream venue where I want to fight is uh, the Pepsi Center at the Paul Arena down in Colorado, like where the Colorado Avalanche and the Denver Nuggets play. That's like my dream because like, I like when I was growing up, I could see that venue from my house. You know what I'm saying? I could see that whole entire venue from my house. So it's like I run by it all the time. So it's like that would be my dream venue. So to main event, like that'd be so cool to main event, like a spot there, or co-main event, or anything. Just be a part of that would be dope. I don't know where the one championship matches, uh, Marias and D- Demetri Johnson three. I don't know where it is in relation to Denver, but I know it's in Colorado. Do you have any? Plans? Yeah, it's like right on the outskirts, and I'll, I'll be at that fight for sure. I'm so stoked about it. But uh, yeah, I fight, I've been at that venue a couple times. So it was like, really? I, I, uh, yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, okay. I've been there handful of times i watched although knockout uh, i think it was manny gambarian at that arena and then he ran up the crowd 
Yeah, I remember that guy. Uh, I'll I'll figure out a way to be there. Uh, last one, favorite rapper. Favorite rapper? Oh, I like Freddie Gibbs. Hell yes. Okay, I respect that. That's good, bro. He just came out with a new album one a couple months ago, right? Yeah, yeah that's like what I was listening to all up until the ask, like, because he came out the week of the ask drop by, so I was like, yep. Yeah. This is over and over again, just bumped the whole album. Uh, what did it mean for the gym and the gym culture when Rob Wilkinson brought back that million dollars in championship? I know he's he's home now, right? But in Australia, but how was it for you guys? You guys celebrating that victory? Oh yeah, for sure, man. That was a it was a huge deal, man. I feel like there's been such huge moments in the gym, but that was probably one of the top ones is just watching Rob change his life. And uh that's a cool guy, man. That that uh that's a good dude and uh, I, I knew he was going to destroy that guy, but he made it look easy. He made it look so easy. It's a, it was super inspiring. And then it was just like, damn, that was, that was cool. Our boy just became a millionaire like that. Man. <laughs> that's, All work, he, was man. Cool, bro. he was such a cool guy. Like I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't, I've never followed PFL that closely. I didn't know much about him, but like his fighting style was great. His personality was great. His accent. Like he just seemed like he's a good guy. And, he, and he's so big that like they had to jump him at our gym. Like it would be like, one minute, one minute and a half with somebody. And the moment that person, like, coach would, like, blow a whistle and then someone else would run in and start beating him up. So it was like, in order for us to even have any success with them, we had to double team him. We all had to jump him as a team. <laughs> uh, if you were to guess any I, – I feel like the flyweight division is so much more open than other divisions. Like, you could fight – there's so many different people who could fight. Uh, Muhammad Mokayev called you out, said some – I don't remember what he said, but he said something. Uh, Abazi, Nikolau. But do you think that maybe the Pantoja rematch might be next, might be on the horizon? Um, I don't think so. They've offered me that fight, and I'm sure they offered him. But he, uh, And I get why. They, but like He's expressed no interest in it. So it's like, I wish that was the fight that would be next. That's the most ideal route for me. But uh, no, it's not going to happen. Maybe a Kai um, rematch? Kai's above you? Yeah, yeah. That's a, uh, Which he shouldn't be above me, but... Uh, <laughs> The Kai, the Kai rematch kind of interests me because I want to go to Australia. Like, I would love to fight in Perth. So, I, like, if if Alex Perez somehow dropped out of that fight, I would love to step in for that. But, uh, oh, yeah, they're both the Moreno re- Yeah, the Moreno rematch interests me the most. And then uh, the, the loser Moreno figure is what I want the most. Makes sense. All right, we got less than a minute. So, I finished every interview with this question. I just want to get an answer from you real quick. When it's all said and done, fighting, training, doing swantons, WWE, whatever it may be, what do you want people to remember most about Brandon Royval above all else? Yeah, that I, I, I think this every time too is like uh, I want people to get a little piece of me every time I fight, and it's just like I want people to get a person, a piece of my personality and the love that I put into the sport, man. I put a lot of love, hours, hard work. I sacrificed so much to to be here, to be, to be in this, even this house, man. Sometimes like I'll walk into this house. I'm like, damn, I can't believe fighting bought this. And it's like, I just want, I just want people to know it's like, damn, like I, I got a piece of that kid every time he went into that cage. And it's like, I, I want, I want people to get that.